Hey there everybody and welcome. Today I'm going to be presenting a tutorial of the Upstairs Downstairs expansion for Obsession, the highly rated board game by designer Dan Halligan. I'm going to be presenting this tutorial with the help of a program I wrote to play Obsession that I'll be using to post other tutorials, sample playthroughs, and solo playthroughs as well. The advantage of my using a program to do this is that it will let you see everything close up. Furthermore, while I'm using the program for demonstrations or playthroughs in this or later videos, it'll ensure I don't make any mistakes or skip over important aspects of the game. Before you ask, please be aware I do write these programs for my own personal enjoyment and I don't make them available to the public due to the obvious copyright restrictions unless the publisher specifically makes other arrangements with them. If you haven't already done so, please watch my slow and steady tutorial for the second edition base game of Obsession before watching this tutorial, unless you're already intimately familiar with the second edition core game rules. The biggest change that Upstairs Downstairs introduces is the appearance of four new servants. The Orange Cook, the Blue Hall Boy, the Pink Head Housemaid, and the brown useful man. Whereas all of the servants in the core game provided mandatory service where needed, these new servants provide optional supplemental service. In other words, it'll be up to you when and how you want to use them. Each player is limited to employing one of each of these servants over the course of the game. You can hire any one of these servants during a normal hiring action, and as you'll soon see, there's another way to acquire one of them. However, you can never use a recruit action on the back side of the butler's room to steal an upstairs downstairs servant from an opponent. The only servant type you can ever recruit that way would be a valet, a lady's maid, or a footman. Let's examine each of these servants one by one. We'll start with the cook. You can place the cook on any activity tile that you're hosting, in addition, of course, to the servant or servants that are required by the tile, if any. If you do add the cook to your activity tile, she provides two benefits. First, she allows you to invite guests to the activity who have a prestige rating that is up to two levels higher than your family's reputation. In this example, our reputation stands at 1, and normally we'd only be able to invite guests with a prestige rating of 1. But because the cook is on the tile, we can now invite Carolyn Viscountess Abernathy to play bowls on the bowling green. She has a prestige rating of 3, but because the cook is on the tile, and we can now have guests invited to this activity with a prestige rating of 1, 2, or 3, Miss Abernathy can join us. So if I asked Miss Abernathy to play bowls with Susan Norris here, Susan Norris required a lady's maid to be in attendance, but if you recall from our base game tutorial, the housekeeper may stand in for a lady's maid when there are no lady's maids available. Placing the cook on your activity tile in order to invite guests with a prestige rating up to two levels higher than your family's reputation is especially useful early in the game when your reputation is still on the low side. However, the cook on the activity tile does provide one additional benefit. She allows you to increase the amount of reputation you would normally gain from this activity by one. In our example, we'll make 300 pounds from the Bowling Green. Susan Norris will add 700 pounds to that, bringing it up to 1,000. And then when we combine Susan Norris's reputation penalty of minus 3 with Carolyn Abernathy's reputation gain of 2, that would normally cause us to lose one reputation. However, with the cook on the activity tile, we gain one additional reputation, causing our reputation to break even. As a result, playing bowls on the bowling green is going to allow us to gain 1,000 pounds without any effect to our reputation, which currently stands at 1.4.
There is one new improvement tile that comes with the upstairs downstairs expansion that requires the cook as the mandatory servant on its front side. It's a blue service tile with a prestige rating of one called the renovated kitchen. When you host the gourmet tasting activity using the renovated kitchen, you must place the cook on the tile as she is the mandatory servant and not an optional one. And that allows you to invite two gentry to this activity. However, as you can see, her gourmet food is so good that the two guests you invite can have any prestige rating at all. So this would allow me to invite Susan Norris to this gourmet tasting, along with Kenneth Viscount Ashwood, who has a prestige rating of five. In addition, even though the cook is the mandatory servant on the renovated kitchen, you'll still gain the one extra reputation she provides during the enjoy favor step, thanks to the value that she brings to the kitchen. As a result, this activity will gain us a total of 1,200 pounds, 700 from Susan and 500 from Kenneth. Normally, we'd lose three reputation because we're inviting Susan. However, the cook's presence on the renovated kitchen reduces the reputation loss to minus two. Once you acquire the renovated kitchen and host that gourmet tasting, the tile flips to its rose side and now provides you with the third permanent benefit of placing the cook on an activity tile. She now allows you to invite one additional guest to an activity, one more than the tile would normally call for. Because we flipped the renovated kitchen and this permanent ability is currently face up, we can now host an activity in the main gazebo, which would normally allow us to invite two gentry. But if we add the cook to the main gazebo, in addition to the required footman, we can now invite Carolyn Viscountess Abernathy, because the cook allows you to invite guests with a prestige rating up to two levels higher than you normally could. We'll invite Susan Norris as well, and because we now have culinary renown, we can invite a third guest, let's say Thomas Viscount Winchester of the Howard family. If we elect to gain one reputation thanks to Thomas, then his one reputation, less Susan's three reputation, plus Carolyn's two reputation, would cause us to break even. But because the cook, is on the main gazebo will gain one additional reputation and therefore our reputation gain would be one less three plus two plus one and there's our prestige guest invite there's only one copy of the renovated kitchen in the game so only one player will be able to take advantage of its benefits. As usual, any time you employ the cook and add her to your activity tile, she is moved to expended service along with all the other servants you use that turn. Next, let's examine the light blue hall boy. The hall boy, a young, somewhat unskilled servant, is never placed on an activity tile. Instead, he can be placed onto one of your invited guests for one of two purposes. He may stand in for the butler when the butler is the mandatory servant for a guest, even if the butler is available. This actually belies the hall boy's menial nature because there's a huge difference between an untrained teenage boy and the professional butler who oversees the household. Having said that, the truth is there are only two cards in the game that require that a butler be in attendance. So this ability of the hall boy may not be as valuable as it seems on the surface unless you happen to have one or both of those guest cards in your hand. 
Second, if you place the hall boy on a guest card that provides a money favor where the hall boy isn't standing in for the butler, but instead is acting as a supplemental servant, he increases the amount of the guest's favor by 100 pounds. In this case, instead of Margaret providing us with one casual guests and 300 pounds, because the hall boy is present on the guest, will instead gain one casual guest and 400 pounds. This may be the hall boy's best benefit of all. If you were able to use him for this purpose every time he was available, and you always had at least one guest who provided a money favor, this would make the hall boy worth as much as 600 pounds over the course of a standard game, which is the monetary equivalent of the village fair. Remember, the hall boy won't grant you the extra 100 pounds if there is no pounds favor on the guest card. Finally, the hall boy may stand in for a footman on the carriage house service tile, even if a footman is available. The carriage house is a new service tile that is included with the upstairs downstairs expansion. When a footman or a hall boy, or for that matter an under butler, is placed on the carriage house in its normal location in the service column, it lets you increase or decrease by one the number of guests required by your current activity tile. So the hall boy being present on the carriage house in this case would allow us to invite three guests to the gourmet tasting in the renovated kitchen. Or, if you only had one guest available in your hand, you could invite one guest. The carriage house doesn't work with suites, which only cater to a single guest, nor does it work on tiles which require only family members like the private study or the west terrace. And naturally, you can't use it to reduce the guest count to zero. If you have the renovated kitchen, and you've already flipped it to its row side. You could even put the hall boy, a footman, or an under butler on the carriage house and place the cook on your activity tile so that you could invite up to two additional guests to your activity. The carriage house itself is a handy tile to have, but if you don't have it in your estate, then this ability of the hall boy doesn't really apply to you. There are two carriage houses included in the upstairs-downstairs expansion. As usual, any time you employ the hall boy and add him to a guest card or the carriage house, he is moved to expended service along with all the other servants you use that turn. The pink head housemaid can be as powerful as the cook in her own way. She can do one of three things. She can stand in when the housekeeper is the mandatory servant on a card, even if the housekeeper is available. This, like the hall boy standing in for the butler, is of minimal value since the housekeeper is the mandatory servant on only two base game cards, one card from the Wessex expansion, and one promotional card. However, if you own the housekeeper's room, another new light blue service tile introduced in this expansion, then the head housemaid can stand in for the housekeeper or a lady's maid on a tile or a card, which would make her extremely formidable, since ladies' maids are in high demand throughout the game. Note that while the housekeeper's room can allow the head housemaid to stand in for the housekeeper or a lady's maid, she can never stand in for the cook. And incidentally, be aware that there's a typo on the housekeeper's room improvement tile. The two sides of the tile should be identical because this tile is never flipped. However, one of the sides indicates that it's worth one victory point, while the other side indicates it's worth zero victory points. The one victory point side is the correct side. So if you buy the upstairs-downstairs expansion and you receive a housekeeper's room that shows zero victory points on one side and one victory point on the other, 
I recommend you place a red X on the zero victory point side so it's never inadvertently placed with that side face up. Perhaps the head housemaid's strongest asset is when she's optionally added to a card or the current activity tile that offers an invite favor. In that instance, she allows you to draw one extra casual or prestige guest card, depending on the favor, from which you can choose who you want to add to your hand. This can be extraordinarily helpful, especially in cases where you would otherwise draw a guest blindly and you'd be forced to hope for the best. In this case, by adding the head housemaid to Philippa, Baroness Haworth, we can choose which prestige guest we wish to add to our hand from a selection of two. We'll choose Eunice Viscountess Palmer. Here's a situation where the head housemaid is added to the current activity tile so that we may choose a prestige guest from a selection of two. We'll choose Alistair Marcus of Kent for his four reputation and his four victory points. Note that in situations where a tile or a guest offers both a casual guest and a prestige guest invite, you must indicate ahead of time which invite you want the head housemaid to apply to. You can only choose this invite ability once per turn, and again, only if the head housemaid is a supplemental servant on the card or tile. It doesn't apply if she's placed as a stand-in for another mandatory servant. In this case, we've added the head housemaid to Isfan Count Hoyas, who provides both a casual guest and a prestige guest. We'll choose to apply the head housemaid to the prestige guest. Therefore, we'll receive one unscreened casual guest and one screened prestige guest. There's the unscreened casual guest and now we'll choose the screened prestige guest. If you use the head housemaid in conjunction with a sweet tile where one or more favors are doubled, she can still only be used one time during that turn. So in this case, if Sir Richard was invited to stay on the Heritage Guest Suite for one night, and he was optionally intended to by the head housemaid, you would gain two reputation, one screened casual guest invite, and one unscreened casual guest invite. As usual, any time you employ the head housemaid and add her to an activity tile or a guest card, she is moved to expended service along with all the other servants you use that turn. The useful man is a jack of all trades who can be used in one of five different ways. If you place him on your private study during a village fair round, he'll generate 200 pounds for you, whether or not you plan for that village fair. So you'd gain 200 pounds if you didn't plan for the village fair, or you'd gain 500 pounds if you did plan for the village fair. That ability is worth 400 pounds to you in a standard game, 600 pounds in an extended game where there are three village fairs. You can use the useful man, if he's available, to reduce the cost of purchasing a tile from the builder's market by 100 pounds, but not to a cost of zero. This increases the useful man's value when coupled with his village fair ability to as much as 1,000 pounds over the course of a standard game.
If he's available, you can place the useful man on your current activity tile to temporarily reduce its prestige rating by one. This would allow you to host a level two activity when your reputation was only one, a level three activity when your reputation was only two, and so on. You can remove your useful man from the game to refresh the builder's market. Instead of paying four reputation via a special action, for example, or sacrificing five victory points by redeeming a VP card. Finally, you can remove your useful man from the game to remove the tile from the 300 pound space in the builder's market, shift all the tiles to the left to fill the gap, then search through the tile bag for a specific tile that you would then place in the 800 pound space. So for example, if we needed the cabinet of curiosities, we could remove the useful man from the game, search through the bag, find the cabinet of curiosities, and then remove the barn, slide all the tiles to the left, and place the cabinet of curiosities in the 800 pound space. The barn that was removed from the 300 pound space would be shuffled back into the bag. Now we have a chance to get access to the cabinet of curiosities, perhaps to fulfill our objective card. A couple of things to note. If you remove your useful man from the game, either to refresh the builder's market or to choose a tile from the bag to place in the 800 pound space, you cannot hire another useful man in the game to replace him. You only get to acquire one of each upstairs downstairs servant throughout the game. So if you decide to remove your useful man from the game, you will not be able to hire another useful man. Also, do you recall that the hunter butler can stand in for any male servant? The useful man is the one exception. You can't use the under butler to pretend he's a useful man. He simply doesn't have the useful man's broad skill set, but he most certainly can stand in for the hall boy. If you place the useful man on the private study, or the current activity tile, or you used him to discount a purchase of the builder's market, he's moved to expended service along with all the other servants you use that turn as usual. Ten public objective cards called milestones are included with the upstairs downstairs expansion and you can use these even if you're playing just the core game, although one of the cards applies to the upstairs downstairs servants and should be excluded in that case. You basically select two of these milestones at random and place them in the center of the table at the start of the game. Each milestone provides two spaces for two different players to claim the objective. The first player to claim it scores eight victory points, while the second player to claim it scores four victory points. Also included are two family crest counters for each family in the game to use when claiming a milestone. For example, this milestone can be claimed as soon as you have flipped seven tiles in your tableau. By the way, note that I said claim a milestone. If you achieve a milestone but fail to realize that until your next turn, Somebody else could potentially steal the 8-point award from underneath you, though I suspect if you're playing a friendly game, you'd be hard-pressed to enforce that. In this upstairs-downstairs expansion, the Howard family has been added to the game. Included is the Howard family board, the organizer and reputation counters and token. The Howard's family's starting bonus is that they start the game with a cook, and therefore they can't acquire a second cook during the game. 
In addition to the carriage house, renovated kitchen, and housekeeper's room that I referenced earlier, the expansion also comes with a single stocked lake, a prestige rated 6 sporting tile, to join the other PR6 tiles that came in the base game, the French garden, the great hall, and the state room. In addition, there's one parish church improvement tile and one babbling brook hybrid tile that you can also add to the bag. These originated from a Kickstarter contest that invited backers to suggest new tile designs, and these were the two winners. They've been integrated with the rest of the tiles and can be used even if you're only playing the base game. There are four monument tiles included in the expansion that you might use to optionally replace the big game trophy room, the imported marble floor, the manor gargoyles, and the sculpture garden. They're essentially the same monuments, but they have much smaller victory point values on them. They're intended for players who don't like the fact that these four monuments in the base game scored a high number of victory points ranging in value from 5 to 10. The replacement set has much lower victory point values imprinted on them, ranging in value from 1 to 4. I suggest you not use these until you've played the game a fair amount, at which point you can decide if you'd prefer to use the lower victory point monuments. There are extra sets of starting tiles included in the event you want to play the game with 5 or 6 players, Furthermore, there are two barn and two servants' hall replacement tiles that are aimed at owners of the first edition of Obsession. You don't need these if you purchase the current second edition of Obsession, the box with the 2E in the top right corner. A new set of 33 objective cards comes with the expansion that includes five that are specific to the upstairs-downstairs servants. You must use this new deck of 33 objective cards when playing with the upstairs-downstairs expansion. If you're playing without the expansion, you should use the deck of 30 objective cards that you received in your copy of the base game. Therefore, you don't want to mix these decks together, since there's no way to tell which deck is which other than by counting the cards. Be sure to keep the decks separate from one another and labeled in such a way that you can tell them apart. There's a set of large victory point cards that are intended to replace the doll cards that came in the base game. A lot of people didn't like having to play with such tiny cards, so you can use these larger ones if you prefer. They're far easier to shuffle and handle. In addition to the four family Howard cards, there are 17 new casual guests and 16 new prestige guests that you can simply add to your decks that came in the base game of Obsession. These are not specific to Upstairs Downstairs, so you can simply shuffle them right into your existing decks and use them all the time. There's also a set of 16 promo guest cards that originated in a contest held in 2018. These cards should not be blindly shuffled in with the other cards because they're potentially game-breaking. Dan suggests that if you want to, you can include three or five of them in one of your games to add a little pizzazz. Just keep in mind that the favors and effects that they add to the game push the envelope somewhat. Lastly, a change to setup when you're playing with the expansion. Add to the servants for hire a number of cooks, hall boys, head housemaids, and useful men equal to the number of players, though limited to five if you decide to tackle a six player game. You should randomly assign the first player token in step one of setup as usual. Then, in step two, take one cook, one hall boy, one head housemaid, one useful man, one valet, one lady's maid, and one footman from the servants for hire area and place them in the center of the table. When playing with a base game, you would start with the player to the left of the first player and proceed clockwise, letting each player choose a family board. Now, when playing with the expansion, each such player, starting with the player to the left of the first player and proceeding clockwise, 
will both choose a family board and at the same time draft one of the servants you placed in the center of the table. The first player will have the last choice of family board and which servant they wish to draft. The drafted servants join the butler, housekeeper, valet, lady's maid, and footman in the available service area of each player's family board. Return any undrafted servants to the servants for hire box on the supply board. As a result, the servants for hire box will contain a different number of servants depending upon which ones were drafted by the players. And that completes my tutorial video for the Upstairs Downstairs expansion of Obsession. If you have any questions or thoughts, please mention them in the comments below. And if you like this video, please click the like button and consider subscribing to my channel to check out all the other board game programs I've written and used over the years to teach and play through a variety of different games. Thanks for watching.